everybody, this is Steve Elke Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we're going to continue our discussion about how groups of goals plot on the change grid. Um, as a reminder for everyone, our primary motivation for doing this, and by the way, I, I hope you guys are seeing our diagram on the screen. Yes? Yes. Yep. Uh, so our reason for doing it is because uh, as I looked at all these different wheels of life and other kind of lists of of uh, life goals and many of them being presented as here's a full look at life, I thought, I don't know, I think there's a lot of missing spots. And so I thought, well, why don't we look at each area of the change grid and say, what kinds of goals might uh, come from that particular uh, energy uh, on the change grid. And that's how we end up getting to where we are. So I identified 25 different little spots on the change grid that I thought were worth uh, stopping for a few moments and looking at and seeing what might be going on there goal wise. And then I took this uh, list of all the goal areas that everybody else had come up with and decided to see where they might fit on the change grid. And that proved to be a rather straightforward process with just a few exceptions. And so building on what we did on Tuesday's call, I would like to um, uh, complete what we started there. So on Tuesday, we talked about these outgrid goal sets things like uh, uh, serving in a role as a leader or you know, taking charge of something, that sort of thing, um, um, eliminating conflict in the danger zone, but working on achievement. And we put career in parentheses because I, I, I think we decided that anything that involves achievement could uh, plot there on the change grid. So why are we somehow or another compartmentalizing it to career achievement specifically? And then financial well-being. We also started uh, or talked a little bit about where education sorts of goals might lie on the change grid, slightly downgrid. And this idea about social capital that I want to get into in more detail in uh, just a few moments. So that would be on the border between the outgrid energy and the upgrid energy. We also took some time to look at what happens on the in-grid side of things, because the in-grid side of things is all about people. And a lot of the goals you find in standard goal setting sorts of programs have to do with primary relationships and family and friendships and all those sorts of things. And we kind of plunked those into different sorts of places. And I think we came to a general consensus around it. Uh, we also talked about the, out, the in-grid danger zone. Um, and the big fear when it comes to relationships is getting lost uh, because you define yourself in terms of all the other relationships you have. And you kind of figure, well, who are you? Um, and so sometimes there's self-esteem issues. So we decided to throw the verb overcoming into, uh, into that. So today I'd like to talk about what's going on upgrid, downgrid, and hopefully get to this midgrid section as well. Uh, so any questions, comments, thoughts, any of you'd like to share before we launch into those two uh, other sets? No, you're all muted. So you know how it works. I'd mute if you want to say something. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, um, first, let's talk about the um, oh, upgrade. We might as well start upgrade. Now, in the upgrade danger zone, uh, we put up there staying out of harm's way because obviously, uh, again, as a recap, if you're in a situation where you believe your ability is tiny and the challenge is on the border of impossible, well, you're in a situation that you definitely want to get out of. That's a situation where you truly are basically, are, are basically being threatened one way or another. And so the goal there became pretty clear. Just get out of harm's way. Whatever form harm is taking, just get out of the way. And uh, so that, that one kind of went in there. So I said, well, what's right down below that? Well, some of the goals that we saw on the kind of standard list were things like um, having an adventure or doing things that you find fun and enjoyable. Uh, there were things like travel and entertainment, going and exploring the world. Uh, and then there was this other side of things about providing and protecting. I'll talk about that in just a second as well. And then we get into the ones on the border. So vision and contribution and social capital and fame. So uh, let's start with looking at the one that would be in location two. That's where I thought there, the goals about adventure and fun would be, because as the way that some of those defined that goal set, it was about getting out of your comfort zone, going and trying new things, 
filling your life with experiences uh, that you would learn from, grow from, et cetera. And so it had that kind of, of feeling that you were stepping knowingly, willingly into the unknown, knowing that you were um, in a situation where the challenge should be greater than your ability. Otherwise, is it really an adventure? And so that seemed to plot quite well. And when I looked at the adjective map, I also found lots of things that would resonate with that. So you're not in a life or death, you know, terrifying situation like you would be up in the danger zone, but there is definitely a high level of alert that's happening in this uh, little upgrade section here. And uh, that can be a very positive thing, even though it can also have some uh, negative sides as well. If I reduce the tension a bit, that's where just things that are of general fun would kind of come into play. And maybe you guys remember me saying that one of the best examples of an upgrade fun experience is a roller coaster. So you know that that roller coaster has been engineered with safety in mind. And so on the one hand, intellectually, you, you get it. You, you, while things do happen, um, statistically, you are in a very safe, controlled sort of an environment. Nevertheless, they engineer the experience to be as, um, what am I, I don't want to say terrifying, but as upgrade as possible. So that at the end of it, you're exhilarated. The adrenaline got released. You know, the endorphin rush has, uh, has happened and all that, that good sort of a thing. So I think that adventure... Uh, more where the number two itself actually physically is and fun slightly below it. But that's what would be going on in this little wedge of things. Um, those of you who uh, know Linda know that she is a bit of a thrill seeker. She is the first one to go parasailing, the first one to go, you know, bungee jumping, whatever, ropes course. Uh, I have no interest in doing any of those things uh, ever, but those would definitely be more of these upgrade but non-life-threatening situations. Questions, thoughts, comments about adventure being in this particular area of the change grid? Yeah, and again, feel free. Yep, David and uh, Jane, oh, you're both. I, in I was just going to say to you that, you know, the only thing is that the the um, the the ability there is 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 low on purpose. Right. Um, but um, uh, you know, as far as uh, thrill seeking is concerned, that that almost seems like an outgrid. Uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that it is outgrid if you um, your assessment of your ability or the assessment of your ability versus the threat would be one that you go, this is a very threatening thing, but I know I've got the ability to do it. So if I said, if you're an experienced rock climber and you're going and climbing a new rock formation, that's probably an outgrid adventure, which might fall more into the category of athletic achievement or something like that, where the upgrid uh, situation is more, you have ability, but you don't you don't realize you have the ability. So you're, you're going, you're experiencing an illusion of a lack of ability. If that kind of, uh, kind of makes a little bit of sense as far as like the roller coaster goes. I mean, what do you have to do in a roller coaster? Just sit in the chair. I mean, just sit there. <laughs> so that's all you've got to do. Everyone has the ability to do that, but boy, don't you feel, if it's a well-engineered roller coaster, don't you feel as though you're going to get frightened. You're going to get, uh, you know, tested. Yes, Jane, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it could be something like bungee jumping because in bungee jumping, you, I don't, I think you're completely out of control and you're just having to trust the people yeah. who tied you on. <laughs> Right, it's a thrill. Now, yeah. the the second time you go bungee jumping, maybe it's more of an outgrid experience than an upgrade yeah. experience. Maybe. Yeah. But that first time, I mean, your ability—you've never done it before. How do you know that your joints aren't just going to snap? You know? I mean, <laughs> who? Why do we have all this faith that our body's ability to stay intact? I don't get it. And well, so, the rope is going to snap. Well, right, all of it, all of it, all of it. So, so I think the first time we do something that that first time real adventure, it's more upgrade. But I think if you have a pattern of doing things, like for example, when I see people surfing. 
I'll go like, well, the first time you tackle a big wave, I'll bet it feels very upgrid because you don't know that you have the the ability necessary to uh, to address that. But as you become more and more skilled, I'm sure that it's more of an outgrid experience. At a certain point in time, you get presented with whatever they call the the grand wave of your life, and um, but you feel like, hey, I've done this often enough. I've got the ability. I can probably tackle this one and and come out the other end, you know, hooping and hollering. So I can kind of see how that changes as our perception of those change of those uh, situations occur. Um, now. I will also say that there's another category of things that happen in this upgrade zone. And those are the things that are scary, but not life threatening, where you are feeling out of control, but you're not feeling um, endangered by it. So I think of those as being more, um, you know, difficult situations, challenging situations. I mean, I, I don't know how to, they're not adventures and they're not fun but what would we characterize them as being then? Um, life challenges, and do I actually have goals about having life challenges or is the goal about handling life challenges? So, so that was my little debate there. How do you, how do you put the, the negative things that could happen there too? Any thoughts about that? Hey, T, can I ask a question? And if this sure. takes us outside of the the comfort of this or, or the purpose of this discussion, I'm happy to just table it. Um, I'm curious, because it's been a while since I've worked with the change grid, where does the person's set of values fit in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it fits in almost everywhere on the change grid. Genuinely, when someone is living a life in full alignment with their values, they're going to be more at the center of the change grid um, because they end up having a value-driven life. And so a value-driven life means they start off by looking at what really is a value to them, what's really important to them, et cetera. And then as they start to step out where life is lived, another layer of the change grid, that would be between the green line and the yellow line, I don't, there, is it that one? Yeah, between the green line and the red line, this is where life is lived. And hopefully if they've gone to the center to reacquaint themselves or to uh, further um, strengthen those values, they take those values with them into those life experiences and then they um, operate in whatever those situations are through those values. As you get outside of the danger zone, values become somewhat questionable. Um, uh, or there, there might be values that get displayed that would not really be values that would be well regarded by society and maybe not even well regarded by you if you stop for a moment and really critically examined um, your life and behavior. So uh, yeah, uh, other questions about thought, thoughts about that? Not for me, thank you. Yeah, so does that, does that resonate with you though? This idea about the center of the change grid is where our values hold yes, true? Yes, I, I, that's all coming back to me now and thank you for that. Where I struggle is between kind of this analytical look, I mm -hmm. think, you know, and the personalized relationship to life for the individual and that's where i'm struggling i think but i'll okay, yeah. can you yeah just go ahead give me an example of that or a, you know perhaps a scenario that you think you go like hmm, what well, you about mentioned, you mentioned um linda's you know um joy of you know adventure mm -hmm. well what i would call adventure right yeah yep, yep. So, well there's a certain amount of um she's she's fulfilling a need for excitement for exhilaration or joy, right? She's sure. not, well, that's not right. She's, she has feelings when she does these things that bring her excitement and joy. Yes. Um, and it satisfies her, her, her need or um, her value for adventure. Right. And so what you're saying, she would fall into the 21. Well, yeah. And by we, we, we just lost you a little bit as far as sound quality goes. <laughs> So I'm wondering, if, is that you? I don't have Me? any background. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, Linda, go ahead, you need. 
I, I just maybe want to, I should probably mute because when you asked me to unmute, maybe the road noise interfered. Yeah, that's okay. And I can also, I can, yeah, I got to mute you, dear. Drive safely. Okay. Right. okay fine. All right. So I just muted her. Yeah, I was wondering where that was coming from all of a sudden. Um, when you were using words like joy and exhilaration, all of those also live in the same area of the change grid. Yeah. So joy is more of an upgrade uh, emotional experience. Exhilaration is most definitely an upgrade sort of a sort of an experience. So that's all in the same kind of uh, region, if you will. Um, it tends to be expressive in its energetic, um, uh, I want to say makeup, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And so, and again, remember that the change grid is unique to every individual, but every individual has a full change grid available to them. Mm -hmm. So just because we have a particular, we'll even talk about values, a particular value set, doesn't mean that there are certain things on the change grid that no longer apply to me. So as an example of that, uh, if we are looking at our values and we go, well, how do our values impact our goals around financial well-being? Well, if we hold a certain set of values uh, and hold ourselves to a certain set of standards, we may have a very different set of financial goals than someone who with a different set of values or, um, you know, beliefs around that sort of a thing. And it could, I think that same pattern would hold true no matter which direction we were to go and examine things in. You reminded me, T. Now I got it. So it really st stems from where we start in terms of our our question and how yeah. we're using the grid. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. That's why I said, you know, part of my problem with these wheel of life things we've been discovering is that is that while I appreciate that it's a, you know, a screening kind of an inventory tool, it's a starting place. Mm -hmm. Some of them get to be very specific and some of them actually say these are the yeah. complete set of and I kind of went like, no, I don't think so. I think they're a little lost. They've gone too far outside. <laughs> yeah, just saying, just saying. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I think we all have these things. And so, for example, my idea of fun, adventure, challenge, I want to add one more word there that you brought up, excitement. Excitement lives the upgrade, but in a positive place. I mean, excitement doesn't put you up in stress, but the upper part of power stress that's that's an exciting place to be um okay so but my idea of a really great adventure and someone else's idea of a great adventure could be dramatically different sorts of things so for example i think roughing it is staying at the motel six i don't think that roughing it involves you know i are you roughing i don't yeah, mean yeah, yeah i'm still with you on the hotel but the motel six that might be that might take that's down. there you go see that, that might be even outside of your definition of roughing it and so you know but like sleeping on the ground outside no <laughs> thank you thank you no um okay all right. So anyway, that's those are some of the things there. So uh, I, obviously, I need to come up with some sort of single activity that encompasses what that would represent. Now, when you start to move a little bit um, higher in ability, we uh, we go from number two to number three. This is where those travel and entertainment sorts of things start to uh, pop into place because you do have a little bit bigger ability. You're traveling. Maybe you're going somewhere where you're going to have adventure, but the act of traveling is something that you probably have a higher uh, reported level of ability to do that because you know by this stage of life you've probably uh, gone and done some little traveling. Um, the goal setting programs want to lump travel and entertainment together. And I think those are two very different things. Maybe they can happen coincidentally, but I don't think they're just variations on the same theme. So, um, and entertainment to me, I almost wanted to eliminate it because entertainment for you could be a downgrade experience. Entertainment for you could be an outgrade experience. It could be a mid-grade experience. I don't know what you find entertaining, but energetically, uh, that's where that little category would seem to resonate. Um, thoughts about that, anyone? If not, I'm just telling you from a from a place of mapping, that's kind of like the default spot where it would fall more because of the travel side of things. Yes, Paula, go ahead. 
I would say entertainment is also a problematic on the wheel too. So you're not, you're not, you're resonating with, with an area that, you know, yeah. again, these are tools, they're opening to the discussion and you yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, this might be an important thing guys to know. I don't intend of ever uh, to ever have this be an actual layer of the change grid. I don't plan on ever showing this to, uh, to uh, you know, the average client or the average consumer. I just wanted to put this together purely for the circle of excellence, our circle of brilliance, so that we could say, well, if we looked at each other, the change grid, are there kind of goals that might help us, uh, might arise? Could this be a useful exercise in creating a more complete set of goal areas? Um, so that's what, it, that's what it's whole intention was so i don't think i'll ever show this to i can't imagine why i would show this to anybody because you know what the ideal place for you to plot when it comes to some of these things are not necessarily in these wedges so you should yeah and uh, maybe i'm wrong i don't think so though but we'll we'll, def we'll definitely play with with that um and the reason why I just had that moment of, of debate and conflict was because as you go about phrasing the activity for goals, the most um, straightforward way to do it is to use the exact same verb for every one of them. And that would be meeting my goals in the area of, and then fill in whatever the area is, or meeting my area, fill in the area goals, or achieving my whatever goals. And so every one of them would have meeting, 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 or achieving, 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 whatever word you use. Most of the time when I'm thinking about goals, it's about achieving those goals reaching those goals. And so I can see how you could just power duplicate that verb for every single activity. But wouldn't that be a yawn fest to fill out? So, so, um, but then I go like, well, even that verb achieving, uh, so if I said achieving the goal, where is the desired location on the change grid for the verb achieving? So if I wanted to achieve my family goals, I would not plot on the in-grid side of things because achieving is what kind of an energy? Analytical, expressive, driver, where, where, where would you, where, what would you say achieving something is? Driver. There's your, it's a driver energy. So anytime you start talking about goals, I promise you the uh, ideal location for that or the energy that would most support you in reaching goals in any of these areas is going to be outgrid. Even if your goal is to achieve balance, that's the exact center. If you are out of balance, the way you get back in balance is to do something conscious and deliberate, whether that's taking up meditation or doing wellness kind of work or developing your spiritual journey or whatever. Those are things you are actively doing in order to create that that situation in the center. So does that does that make sense? Um, and I'll, I'll throw it to you this way as a, this is a gifted students quiz question. You can all unmute and give me your answer so you can show me how brilliant you all are. But if the goal was for you to achieve balance in your life and you plotted in the exact center, what would that tell me about you achieving your goals of having balance in your life? What does that centered location tell me about you working towards achieving balance in your life. <laughs> you need to up your game. Yeah, because look where you're at. You're kind of in the middle, kind of going like, well, I'll just, I mean, in the middle, the middle's a glorious place, glorious place. But in the middle, we allow things to unfold in their own natural way. We detach ourselves so that we can observe what's going on. That art of caring detachment goes on. Um, we are in the world, but not of it. We realize we cannot push the river nor pull the sprout. And so if that's my mindset, when it comes to developing my balance or uh, correcting imbalance as the case may be, that center location is not going to support me in doing the work necessary to get to that spot. Isn't that strange? But that's the way that it all works. And so that's why I'm saying like, we can't use this and say, look, all of the goals about family and parenting, ideal location is in this number 18 wedge. That's not true. 
That's just not true. It's just energetically, if I look at parenting and all that, that's more of an in-grid sort of an energy. But that doesn't mean that's the desired location for achieving. Um, okay, have I babbled enough about that? Or do you guys get my, get my point? Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so ideal locations are dictated by the verb that you are looking at where um, certain characteristics, qualities about life are going to resonate energetically with different locations on the change grid. But there's a big difference between where you are on the change grid and wanting to change where you are on the change grid. So hopefully you guys can feel those as two very different activities that may require very different levels of productive tension. Um, okay. So now uh, moving a little bit further down grid and out grid, the next one here is one I find very interesting. This is social capital um, or fame. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of social capital. Social capital is all about uh, your ability to connect people to other people, your ability to connect people to information, to connect people to resources. So the more highly networked you are, the more social capital you have to offer, the more valuable you tend to be, to be perceived. And certainly in this um, day and age of social media, we know that those influencers um, have a tremendous amount of social capital. Uh, in in uh, concrete terms, like the number of followers that they have, but also just in kind of perceived terms. People who have goals around social capital may also be on a quest for fame. Um, and this also is where conspicuous consumption might actually occur. And so I'll give you a little story just before our call began. I was looking at some of the news headlines and I don't know where in the country this is, but I think it's in Texas. But there's this kid, he's 17 years old. His father is a billionaire, started a hedge fund of, or no venture capital, one of those kinds of things. Um, and he has a very large collection of these exotic cars. His 17 year old decided to take out his purple name of car I don't have never even heard of before, but the car is worth $3.4 million. And the kid basically got into an accident. He's okay, but slammed it into something. And his whole answer for all of his Instagram followers, he's got like 100,000 Instagram followers, is stuff happens. He doesn't say stuff, but stuff happens. And I'm kind of going like, I don't care if I'm a billionaire or not. If you're going to wreck my one of a kind $3.4 million car, we're going to have a conversation. And uh, but I go, that's conspicuous consumption that is being used specifically as a tool to gain social capital, to gain the fame. Obviously, the kid doesn't need money. So what's he doing it for? What's he doing it for? And it all goes back to this social capital, which in many times is like an illusion of value uh, that uh, you think that fame is going to bring you. Uh, so social capital can have a very positive sort of quality to it. Those of you that are good networkers that are very well connected um, uh, in the business world or wherever, uh, whatever area of life you're looking at, that, that's what social capital is all about. Social capital is not friendships. Um, our social capital is not the kind of Facebook accounts that all of us might have. We're just trying to keep in touch with a handful of people <laughs> that's going on. Social capital and the development of it, the goals around it are all about building that following, building that fame. Now, if we go back to some of the eight type personality typing systems, this is where that influencer energy might come into play. I know like in DISC, a quadrant one, they'll use influence for upgrid, but this is specifically where the upgrid energy of um, that uh, expressive energy meets the outgrid driver energy. So you have a borderline expressive driver driven expressive. They want to go somewhere. They want to go somewhere with that whole outward expression of uh, whatever um, the dynamic they're trying to put forth. So this is where charisma lives, schmoozing lives, romance lives, all those good sorts of, uh, of, uh, of things. So any questions, comments about social capital, fame, conspicuous consumption? Would you say schmoozing? Schmoozing, yep. 
<laughs> schmoozing yeah that's what happens because here's a, an interesting thing so i'll put you guys in a situation and ask you a question around it so um you're in a situation that you view as being number one highly important to you highly highly important to you very challenging but you only view your ability as being moderate to meet that challenge so perhaps you found yourself at a social function where you are encountering people that you didn't realize you were going to encounter who could be profoundly important in your future and had you known you were going to encounter these people, you might have prepared differently. But bottom line, there you are in that moment. What does a human use as a replacement for ability when they are in a situation like that? Words. Words. Tell me more. So what do, what do they, how do they carry themselves? How do they present themselves? They don't feel like they've got the knowledge, the skill, the experience, the actual ability to do the best job in that situation. So what do they turn to as a uh, compliment or as a substitute for? Charisma. That? Charisma. They turn on the charm. And so when you're feeling uncomfortable in a social setting and you don't know what to say and what to do, you become charming. And so you're smiling in all the right ways and you're laughing at things that really didn't need to be laughed at. And you're putting the spotlight on other people because your thought is, if I can't impress them, at least let me get them to like me. And that's also this idea about developing some social capital. So schmoozing, flirting, uh, anything like that, like put yourself in a sales kind of scenario. That's, that's one of the things involved with romancing the deal or cultivating that relationship with what, whoever the prospect might be. If you look at the adjective map, the other word you're going to find there is smooth. And smooth has five O's in it. It's not smooth, it's smooth. Okay, so that, that's what's happening in that particular area, the change grid. Um, other thoughts, comments about social capital, fame, conspicuous consumption? No. All right. Now, keep in mind that someone who is truly a leader, who actually has a higher level of ability, do they rely on social capital and fame? Do they try to buy their way into impressing you through conspicuous consumption? Or are they using a different skill set that renders those things optional, if not counterproductive? Are you with me on that? Yeah, I would because agree with that because that leader is trying to develop character and the character is what ultimately is going to, uh, you know, come through most clearly. So, and that comes because you have knowledge. So we say that the elements of credibility are um, that I uh, have to, uh, you have to have um, um, trust, we have to have um, experience and we have to have a certain level of charisma in order to have that. Well, now we're starting talking a little about how do you move from that social capital into that leadership function. People who are leaders of organizations today may very well have earn their right to move up that ladder by becoming good with social capital. This is also, I wanted to put now, this is about playing politics, but politics seems to be a very sore subject these days. But I'm talking about in, in office politics, inner office politics is also what happens uh, at number four. But social capital would be the more positive way to express it. David, Jane, you're both unmuted. Anything you'd like to uh, add to that? Uh, no, no, well, I, I think social capital is um, is a really good, you know, a really good thing to have mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um no, I don't know that I have anything brilliant to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> but no but I mean come on it really is true so for example you're a physician and so I'm going to believe that that physicians who have strong social capital inside of the medical world are able to give better referrals to their patients than physicians who have no social capital. So because they're just not included, they're not involved, they're not exposed enough to be able to bring anything uh, to that uh, to that person in terms of connections and resources. Yes, go ahead. Well, 
what if, what happens when um, so for example in that situation I see value in somebody who remains vulnerable and curious so even if they're not the, the consumer of the you know the knowledge they're vulnerable enough to admit to it and remain curious enough to ask the questions to learn. Well, I think that's absolutely right for what's happening in this location on the change grid, even just set the whole social capital part away anyway. The person who is in this area of the change grid is very much in uh, a learning kind of a mode. I mean, look what they're acknowledging. They're in a challenging situation and they only have moderate ability to be uh, handling it. So they're trying to figure it out. There's a, a puzzle they're trying to solve. There's some uncharted territory. Uh, last time around, we started talking about creativity. This is where creative problem solving comes into play. And as I said a few moments ago, one of the things that people do um, in the main category of schmoozing and charisma and all that is that they put the spotlight on other people. So I know one of the ways that I can really strengthen a relationship with someone is that if I am genuinely curious to, uh, to learn about them and know about them. And I'll share a story to illustrate that with you. Uh, this goes back years and years and years. Uh, Linda and I had a couple of friends that uh, we would go to uh, Niagara on the Lake or to Stratford uh, in Canada to see the Stratford Festival Theater productions, usually Shakespearean productions, or, or we'd go to Niagara on the Lake and see um, a, a broader variety of kinds of shows. But these are two uh, cities in Canada that are very much known for their theater seasons. And uh, we would get season tickets or we would uh, look into the weekend we wanted to go and choose all the things we wanted to see, yada, yada, yada. So we'd made our all plans. Just a couple of days before we were going to leave, um, our friends let us know that something came up and they aren't able to go. And so they said that they had uh, kind of sold their tickets to this other couple that we had not met. Everyone's going to drive separately. We meet up with them. And so Lynn and I go up there and we uh, said, all right, well, you know, we're going to meet these people. We might as well go have a meal because we're going to be sitting next to them for a half a dozen plays. So let's get to know them. And so we decided that we were going to apply some of our principles as we were there. And we were going to become genuinely curious about these people. We we're going to ask them all kinds of questions and just learn as much as we could. And that's exactly what we did. So for the whole long weekend, it was a good four days together we were always learning about them. And by the time those four days were over and done with, we knew everything there was to know about their careers, their medical conditions, their kids' problems. I mean, we, we'd heard it all. Now, it was very interesting that while all that was going on, we also noticed that they never asked us anything about us. So it was never returned. We put the spotlight on them and they were more than happy to have the spotlight on them. They never pointed it back at us. Not an exaggeration. They never asked us anything about us. So we get back to uh, uh, back home and a couple of days later, we get a phone call from our friends who had to cancel. And they said, boy, did you guys make a great impression on this other couple? They said that you were the two most interesting people they had ever met that is too funny that isn't is it though really <laughs> isn't it funny isn't that interesting and so just the act of being genuinely curious and we were genuine we really wanted to know um being genuinely curious about somebody else and putting the spotlight on them endears them to you or endears you to them whatever the direction would be um and so this relationship is uh, is strengthened or whatever the case may be. I can tell you right now, Linda and I, it's all a blur to us. We don't really <laughs> remember any specific details about them whatsoever. But that, I think, illustrates what, what Paula brought up uh, in this particular point. If we don't have what we need, let's become inquisitive. Let's do that. What we are doing, though, without even thinking about it, is we are developing social capital, even though we did not develop a friendship, because a friendship implies some level of mutuality. And uh, there was nothing mutual going on there at all. It was just, yeah, social capital. Okay, but other thoughts about that? Yes. The need for connection, which must have been a, a value for you at the time. Well, you know, um, Linda and I are both rather quiet people. And so 
we like going places with people we already know because it's easy. Um, and the thought that we're going to spend four days with people we don't know made us wonder if we could come up with another couple who could go in our state <laughs> instead of us. So, yeah, so it's not all that. We weren't really looking forward to it, but we thought like, oh, let's, let's use our skills. Let's make the, 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 the best of this kind of a situation. So, so yeah, I mean, a lot of good things happen at this spot on the change grid. And so if you have goals around developing social capital, becoming famous, um, or, you know, having things that you can't really justify having for any reason other than the fact that you wanted it, uh, well, that's what's really happening in this spot on the change grid. It was like Linda pulled you into her sense of adventure. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Linda and I both learned early on that uh, while we'll go to the theater and we'll have a good time while we're there, we're not really theater people. So, yeah. Anywho, um, but we like being with our friends. So there, there you go. Again, that leadership thing would be the next step up because the person's ability has increased. And certainly that leadership and that character development could ultimately lead the person to whatever levels of achievement that they want to reach. So hopefully you guys can feel how this moved around uh, that upper right section of the change grid. So let's go over to the left side for just a second and see what's going on. Now, what we're doing is in, instead of introducing a driven driver secondary energy. Now we're looking about an amiable secondary energy. And so immediately to the left of that vertical adventure, we have number 20, providing and protecting. So providing and protecting. So let's now look at how parents might behave when they take their kids on one of those fun, exciting adventures. Um, I can certainly see how the parent knows, well, the kids aren't any great jeopardy, but I got to keep my eye on them because this, this, this knowledge that you have to protect somebody or that you have the opportunity to be protective and right along with it, providing for someone. So let's make sure they're safe. Let's make sure they're fed. Let's make sure they're whatever the case may be. So the level of challenge isn't so high that anyone is in a life or death situation, but the challenge is high enough that I am on alert or I am very much aware of what might be going on uh, all around me. So this is is about your goals around providing for and protecting those that you love. So um, thoughts about providing and protecting? Okay, so if you want to make sure your kids have got the best life they can have, and if you want to make sure that uh, no one's ever, uh, you know, getting themselves in any kind of trouble, whatever, that's what's happening in this particular spot on the change grid. Um, questions, thoughts? Jane, you're unmuted. Don't know if you're just unmuted. For I'm me. just sitting here. Okay. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still back on social capital and what, how the value of that and um, mm -hmm. your ability to connect people with other people or yeah. ideas with people or resources with people. Yeah, that's social capital. It's a very high value, particularly mm -hmm. in our my partner and I's business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really important. And for the person, again, who's building all that, their next step towards achievement would be about developing these leadership sorts of positions. So how many people have social capital, but that's that's where they stop as opposed to going like, well, I do have all this social capital. Maybe I should be a volunteer for this organization, or maybe I should take that um, officer position on such a such a league or whatever the case may be. So they go like, let's move into leadership. How can I now leverage all my social connections to make a difference? And um, obviously I'm implying there that they're doing something that uh, kind of resonates with their character as opposed to just moving into fame and fortune or fortune down here, financial well-being. In fact, I should add fortune there. Sometimes that's what they're after. It's not about well-being. If it was about well-being, they could have stopped making money long ago. Now, for whatever reason, they just want fortune. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, okay, so Jane, other thoughts about the social capital? Uh, sorry, or? I didn't mean to take everybody off. Oh, no. Ask, no. No, this is all this is all good stuff because again, uh, you know, no one's dropping off the call, so it's all good. <laughs> so um, now moving further in grid, this idea about vision and contribution, um, I thought this was an interesting one because this is really about how you go about volunteering. 
how you go about, um, you know, contributing to charities, doing uh, outreach kind of work, having a greater vision uh, for what uh, the world needs or what your local um, community might need. So that's what this quality is really all about. So it's seeing that there are people who are in need and rising to the occasion of the opportunity to be helpful to people who are in that situation. Um, and so that I put down contribution, but I didn't want it to, you to think I'm talking about financial contribution. That may be that, but financial stuff is really all over here. So if you're thinking about having an actual um, charitable giving element in your overall financial uh, wellness portfolio, that's over here. Um, uh, it's not, it's over here. This is about contributing more of your time, your energy, your, your thoughts and efforts and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's that, that whole charitable sort of a, sort of an element to it. Thoughts about that one? I really love the balance with it on, on here with the social capital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, and, um, but yeah, no, both the, the protecting provide vision contra contribution. I don't have any questions about those as far as it relates to the grid. Yeah, and so let's go back to social capital. People with good social capital can do a great job on the whole volunteering side of things too. And that's mm -hmm. why, now this is something I was gonna talk about uh, next Tuesday, is that when you, I, I've already had some people fill out the profile, even though I wanna further refine the activity list itself. And one of the things that I'm struck with right away is that no one can work on 25 goal areas simultaneously. You can't. So what you want to do instead is look at how they rated the importance of certain goals for them and go, well, the ones that are, uh, the, the, some of these work together. And so if I said, if you really want to do great things when it comes to your vision and contribution, you know, charitable sorts of, of things, what other goal areas might be of great value to you, be very supportive if you cultivated them? So I could certainly say that someone who wants to be of service to humanity could very much enhance their ability to achieve those goals if they cultivated some of the social capital sorts of goals. And um, they might also do very well to cultivate some education and personal development goals. So I think some of these things kind of travel together very naturally. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thoughts about that, Paula? Did that, uh... I, I'm I'm there with you. I you know I struggle from a visual perspective that mm -hmm. some of this is below the line, <laughs> but I'm getting over it. <laughs> okay, Mary, tell tell me about below the line. What does that mean? Oh, I'm just I'm I, simply put, you know, that everything that's moving upwards towards the top of the diagram feels like it's 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 got um, more okayness about it, where the things below the line are where oh. you would. Nay, nay, nay. We'll have to complete this whole thing so you'll see the fullness of it. Uh, keep in mind, anything in the upper half of the change grid represents a situation where perceived challenge exceeds perceived ability. And so this is where we're growing, learning, solving problems, gaining, putting ourselves out there in order, you know, making ourselves maybe slightly uncomfortable in order to do something else. We're down grid. These are where our abilities now exceed our level of challenge. And so these are where our greatest strengths lie. And so it may very well be that, that in order for us to do these upgrade goals more effectively, we need to look at what our downgrade strengths may be and see if we can find some way to, uh, to mobilize these into uh, action for these more upgrade sorts of things. So yeah, life is always lived from up grid towards down grid. We don't discard life just because we arrive down grid. It just takes yeah. on a different energy around yeah, that. When we get there, I have some questions for some of those, but let's keep oh, going. Lovely, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, and so uh, now that's, that uh, pretty much completes the whole upper section of things. And we're at the, the top of the hour, pretty, pretty darn close here. So, but I, I thought last thing I would do is just let's step to the center of the chain grid for just a second and um, 
you can see what these uh, what these inner ones are, are all about. Now, remember, on the change grid, this would be the place where you guys are starting to get towards balance. And um, so activity number 21, it's over here, this little blue circle, that's safety. And we have safe, secure, happy, and healthy. Do you remember from your basic training in ChangeWorks, I said that as we look at the world around us, we're always performing an assessment to determine if we are four things. And those four things are, are we safe, secure, happy, and healthy? And if we look at the world around us and we realize that we are not as safe, as secure, as happy, or as healthy as we might want to be, nature tells us we need to do, to do something. Nature tells us we need to change. And so the ones that tend to, to live more upgrid are issues around generalized safety. So it's not, uh, it's not this extreme sort of a feel of, uh, you know, getting safe or staying safe, providing and protecting. This is more, uh, this area is the essential state of being safe, feeling safe. So not doing anything that puts safety into a question. Because if you think about that, if you decide to go out there, build social capital, you might be putting yourself a little bit of risk of re rejection. And that could be interpreted as uh, feeling less safe. Uh, if you're out there traveling and doing things, there's there could be some safety questions. If you're actually doing real adventure, fun, challenging, excitement sorts of things, or you're actually in harm's way, those are safety issues. Providing and protecting has an element of safety involved. And certainly when it comes to the kind of charitable work that um, t seems to come top of mind, we're now concerned about others' safety. Um, and so th th these things all resonate with safety. As you approach the center of the change grid and you're looking at your own life, you're applying the oracle of the self, 20, area 21 is all about just saying, in general terms, um, do you feel safe? So how safe do you feel? And uh, ideally, we would say, that one's going pretty good. Yeah, overall, my uh, my goal for feeling safe is, is being met. And so we can actually have some goals that are there, and that's a little bit more. This inside, this interior area is also where all spiritual life ends up falling. So some of it very much in the center and others uh, around it. We'll talk about that in grand detail as we get more to that different section on the change grid. So on Tuesday... I guess we'll take a look at the bottom of things. And this is about how we take a high level of ability and a relative low level of challenge, and we set goals there. Now, the interesting thing about setting down grid goals is that that concept all by itself moves us out of being down grid, right? Think about that, to move myself upgrid. An upgrid maneuver is about increasing the standards against which I'm measuring my own performance. An upgrid maneuver is about changing a task in some slight or profound way. An upgrid maneuver is about awakening emotions uh, that would be uh, that would resonate with uh, other areas of the change grid. Upgrid maneuvers are about boosting accountability. So all of those things imply movement is going to happen somewhere where and the only place I can go is up. And so that's why when we say, yeah, we're going to be realizing down here that we have all kinds of goals around uh, health and around um, um, uh, mastering something, really becoming highly, highly adept at something. So getting to the to the point of, of excellence in our performance, that sort of thing, creative pursuits. And we're going to like, yay, you're there, all these things, good. Okay, well, now what? I promise you the goals people come up when it comes to creative pursuits is not to stay exactly the way they are. And when it comes to mastery, yes, go ahead, David. I was just going to ask, isn't it funny if you think back to all the graphs that you've read, how many 9, 10, 12, 13, 8 clusters oh, yeah. you find? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's always stuff plotting heavily down grid. And when we see those, we know we're looking at untapped potential. Uh, we are looking at a high level of achievement of ability versus challenge. Maybe where we are encountering people who have actually mastered something, or at least believe they've mastered something because they haven't looked for a higher standard to go after. Um, but these, this, all this plotting downgrade, all these things energetically represent two things simultaneously, great accomplishment and untapped potential. 
And so generally the goals are going to be about the untapped potential part of all that. So if I say, well, my goal for health, wellness, fitness, and self-care is to put no energy into any of those things because I'm already all set with all of them. Well, that's not even a goal. But people on their change grids, we've actually seen it already, rate this one as being very low in terms of importance. So, um, or, or they'll talk about creative pursuits. This is very low when it comes to importance or developing mastery, very low. Depending where they are, they take education very low for importance. And they, they, they take their household environment kind of, kind of for granted. And so we go like, all right, maybe things are good enough, but what would happen if we started to set some developmental goals around these more downgrade kinds of areas? And so that's what we're going to be looking at on, um, on uh, Tuesday's call. And um, I'm, I'm glad we're having this depth of, of, of dialogue around it. I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. Uh, so any final thoughts, comments? Definitely enjoying it. Thank you, T. You're welcome so very much. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, you guys have yourself a wonderful weekend and we will talk again on Tuesday. Obviously, we won't have a call next week. Thursday, it's Thanksgiving, but I thought we could uh, have one on Tuesday. All right. So thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.